All right, so let's go ahead and look at Lake Ecology. Um, I do apologize for not getting your notes to you earlier on. Uh, before we do the Lake Ecology, but um, what I wanted to just very quickly, there was one slide that I did not get in last time. Uh, this is going to kill me, so let me just quickly adjust this a little bit. Um, there was one slide I didn't get in into the stream ecology. And you no noticed I was a little bit lost there because my slides were so small I couldn't read them, so I was <laughs> reading it. Okay. But stream ecology, there's some terminology on stream ecology that I just wanted to uh, um, talk about. Was you basically got something called, well, it's up here. Uh, let me. You've basically got something, you've got a stream channel that is this, the whole width of this. So where the stream is in normal flow is not the only part of the channel. Your natural channel is also this little flood plain over here. And so the middle of that stream or the lowest point of that stream is called the Thalweg, uh, which is German for the valleyway. And... Uh, this side here, a side slope there, is called a scarp. So, you know, you might find a hydrologist or something kind of using this terminology. But it's the, the thol people might, you might hear people talk more about tholwegs than scarps themselves. You know, they'll say, well, let's go to the tholweg and have a look at this, that, or the other. So that's just terminology you might want to keep in mind as you, um, as you carry on. Uh, when we talk about lakes and lake ecology, lakes are basically just an, a reflection of the environment around them. So they're a, a reflection of the ecosystem upstream of them. They're a, a, a reflection of the geology, uh, 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 the, the countryside, the uh, um, you know things like bedrock geology, soil, the vegetation, land use, and even ap atmospheric. Uh, deposition, and I'm trying to think what the other words, a simple word, just basically the landscape, the topography. So lakes are a function of those things, um, and they are they are a lot more susceptible to things like aerial deposition, just because of their wide area, than than things like streams. Um, one of the things that we we found is that aerial deposition of nitrates or nitrogen. Is, is fairly large. Um, you know, it's about a significant portion of our nitrogen budget in, in nature. Uh, so, uh, and that might be up to about 40%. So, the, the lakes are going to be uh, this reflection of the watersheds. They're also a reflection of their morphometry. So, for instance, if you had to look at anyone know sort of more or less what the shape of Gr Lake Greenwood is? If you go up to, it's, um, Lake Greenwood is on the Saluda, but it's a long kind of finger-like lake. So it kind of, this is South Carolina, my beautiful drawing. Lake Greenwood is upstream of Lake Murray, it kind of looks like that. Uh, and when you go down here, Santee Cooper runs Lake Moultrie and what's the other one? I think this is Lake Moultrie here. But they run two lakes over here that are have a very large surface area, but are no more than about 10 foot deep, you know, at normal operating depth. Whereas this one is, you know, pretty darn deep. So the lake morphometry in this one is very, very different to this one. You know, you expect, for example, much larger evapotranspiration rates here, or evaporation rates here than over here. So that's, that's something, you know, your, your area, your depth, your perimeter, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, if you have a look, uh, the morphometric characteristics of a lake, elevation, lake area, watershed area, Area of the watershed to the area of the lake, maximum depth, you know, lake volume, that kind of stuff. So those are those are things that limnologists, limnologists are people who study lakes, 
are going to kind of look at that kind of stuff as well and say, okay, well, this is this is what what goes on. The other thing is, uh, if you have a, if you think back to our uh, our data or not data, but uh, R sixty one sixty eight, if you'll remember our nutrient criteria increase the further downstream we go, the further towards the coastal plain we get. And that's a function of watershed size. The larger your watershed size, the larger your nutrient loading is going to be. And, and why would that be? I mean, would you be, why would you postulate that your nutrient loading would be larger as, as, you, as you have larger watershed? You're just pulling from a bigger area? Pulling from a bigger area, yeah. And what's happening to your water over that over that period? If you remember the, the hydrology, do you remember a significant por portion of that water also goes up evapotranspiration? So you've got this very large area, you know, and so why would one... So the area is not necessarily the thing that... Or, 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 uh, you, you, you're pulling stuff from different areas, so your likelihood of pulling stuff in increases. You know, you might have more wastewater treatment sites on bigger rivers, bigger streams, and that kind of stuff. But the other thing that, that, that's a function of it would be, you know, evaporation. And if you remember the South Carolina water budget, you had a large amount of evaporation going on. So uh, that's going to be one of the things. So typically, any kind of lake... You'd expect Lake Moultrie down on the coast to have a, a, a slightly higher phosphorus con a concentration than a la Lake Greenwood up here. You'd probably expect Lake Moultrie to be more eutrophic. Uh, so, in other words, it's got a higher likelihood over there in Lake Moultrie that you're going to find um, algal blooms in the summer. Okay, the other thing is... Retention time. Uh, are you guys familiar with the concept of retention time? Let's quickly go. They also call it flashing rates. Um, So if I have um, a vessel where I'm putting one gallon per minute in and taking one gallon per minute out, so it's a steady state kind of um, steady state kind of situation. So you've got that vessel. My retention time then is going to be one gallon. That's my volume over one gallon per minute. So or gallon. Okay, so my gallons cross out and I have one minute. So retention time is in terms of minutes. So, uh, in, in, so in other words, retention time is going to be lake volume over uh, flow rate or what's that called? Outflow. Let's call it outflow. And so outflow, you probably want to calculate your retention time over an annual sort of what, what's your average flow rate over the whole year rather than calculate it for the summer or the winter. Or you might calculate it as an average for the summer or an average for the winter because your summer flows are going to be a lot lower than those in the winter. Um, so typically... Those are our retention times. Uh, there are some other examples that you can see over here in terms of turnover. But the larger your retention time, in other words, you can see some things over here. Lake Superior, 191 years, whereas Lake, Lake Wateree has a retention time of 27 days. Uh, what would that tell you about Lake Superior and Lake Watery's response to some kind of environmental disturbance? Yeah, any sort of environmental disturbance is going to stick around and be diff more difficult to mitigate 
naturally in Lake Superior. Yeah, it's going to take it. You know, you Lake Superior. Uh, you know, you start dealing with some of those outflows, which they have done for years and years and years. It's going to take a heck of a long time for that to sort of propagate through. Whereas Lake Watery, um, that problem can be solved very easily. There's there, you'd probably be able to see a very quick stimulus response rate. So you can see some of these large lakes, uh, their, their retention times are, you know, in the order of years, whereas our lakes over here, like uh, Lake Wiley is above Lake Watery, Lake Murray, if you guys all know Lake Murray has a retention time of 300 days. So that's fairly small as far as lake ecology is concerned, nothing like those great lakes. So the problems that we deal with are, um, if we have, say, a, 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 some kind of event where we just get this massive bubble of phosphorus that comes in, we can flush that out relatively quickly. Um, of course, there are caveats to that, but that's kind of, um, those are some of the things that we talk about in lake ecology. Um, they're not the things, those are general things, they're not the things that interest me as much as variability. I think what I really, uh, I'm a chemical engineer, as an undergrad in chemical engineering, what we were taught was to assume for the most part that all vessels, everything was sort of perfectly mixed. And so you just kind of pretended... You knew things weren't perfectly mixed, but you just pretended that they were. And so, you know, when I looked at a lake, I just thought as the looked thought the lake, you could approximate the lake as having a an average temperature, an average uh, uh, phosphorus concentration. You know, everything you could average it out, or you could take a sample, and that would be representative, and nothing. In lake ecology, nothing could be further from the truth, especially in the summer months. And that's what we want to kind of focus on today. So lake variability uh, begins with lake temperature. And lake temperature is going to uh, affect all sorts of other things. And lake temperature and of, course, uh, and, of course, a depth as well. So before we look at anything... There's that picture called horizontal and vertical variability. And let's look at that very quickly. Um, this is the riparian zone. Well, there's the lake. And there's the lake water. So the lake, the, the area, you know, where we've got the trees and everything, is called the riparian zone. It's the same as what we would call next to the zone, uh, next to a river, right there. So it's the, 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 the ground uh, right next to the lake itself. And then you've got the surface of the lake over here. And you, you have, a couple, of, you have a, a couple of zones. And this zone over here is called the littoral, L-I-T-T-O-R-A. What might that be? Take a wild guess. I'll give you some clues. Yeah, pretty much the, the, the point to where your light penetrates, and this is where you're going to have the growth of uh, rooted plants, so macrophytes, that kind of thing. So that's, that's pretty much your littoral zone. Okay. Um, you also have something called, let me make sure I've got it right. Uh, this is your littoral, and often people... When they look at a littoral, uh, the high, for instance, uh, it, the amount of littoral 
uh, associated with the lake is going to be considered a percentage of the, the area. So the larger that literal, uh, uh, in other words, in percentage, if it's like 32% of the lake, that's going to tell you pretty much that the lake is not that deep. You know, a lot of, you know, it's kind of shallow. Whereas a very small percentage, um, now Lake Tahoe is different because you've got a lot of light penetration. But if it's a much smaller percentage of that lake, that would suggest that the lake is going to be a lot deeper. Uh, and typically the littoral will be between 10 to 15 foot. Okay, and That's kind of the ballpark. Uh, that's what they'll say. They don't necessarily go out with secchi discs and figure that out themselves. Um, the, 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 the other part of it, limnetic, the limnetic zone, that's the deeper lake part of it. So what is not literal will be the limnetic zone. And within that limnetic zone, you'll actually have what is known as a euphotic zone. So, this euphotic zone, of course, again, is where light can penetrate and where you can have algae growing. Okay. Below that, you have what is known, let me make sure, that's your bent, well, your bent zone is actually um, here at the bottom. So, literal is where, where light penetrates to the ground, I guess. Precisely, yeah. Okay. So, once your, if your ground is deeper than that, so that's basically where you can start fight a, a, a macrophytes. Yeah. So that's basically it. And, and so what happens, for instance, in a lake that's eutrophic, is that this littoral actually, as your turbidity increases, the size of this littoral decreases. Now, why is that a big deal? You should know this because of your background. Why, why would it be a big deal if my littoral started shrinking? Your littoral is what now? Sorry. Why would it be a big deal if over time turbidity had in, to increase and this littoral zone started to, would, have, would start to decrease? Why would that be a, a big deal? What's biologically what's associated with that littoral zone? Plants. Plants and, and, fish. and what fish? That's right. It, uh, the littoral zone is kind of the breeding place for, especially well, for fish. So that's where baby fish can hide, and that's where the mama fish lays the eggs and does what she does with the baby fish. Okay. So once you start reducing this zone, you are essentially reducing the amount of habitat that allows uh, certain fish to spawn and you might see a, a reduction in population of a certain kind of fish that uses this area. Catfish don't mind this, you know, they, they'll sit at the bottom and who knows what catfish do. Okay, but it's a, that's a real big deal there, okay? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a fish habitat. Okay, and then you have this benthic zone and in most lakes, uh, around here, or in most lakes, it, it's kind of, if you had to, I mean, who's walked in a, a big old lake? What does it feel like the, at the bottom? Squishy. Squishy, squishy and squishy. nasty, yeah. And you pick it up, what color is it going to be? Brown. It's going to be kind of brown and black. And you might smell it and it's kind of nasty. So that's mm -hmm. often an indication that you've got a lot of fine material and a lot of organic material that has settled. Now, a lot of that organic material is, uh, would be um, the, 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 the bodies of dead micro, or dead plants and animals, dead plankton. They serve their life, they do their thing, they've got all this phosphorus, and then as they die, they kind of, float to or drizzle down to the bottom. So there's the steady drizzle of these plankton that hits the bottom. Now they sit at the bottom and you've got bacteria, microbes basically that begin to decompose them. 
when decomposition starts, what what's the element that's really required in that in that process? Oxygen, 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 oxygen. So you have that decomposition, and eventually, what often happens in an eutrophic situation is that the decomposition becomes anaerobic. And when it becomes anaerobic, instead of having things like uh, nitrates that come out, we have stuff like ammonium because it's still a nitrogen, but oxy oxygens are scarce, and that's what come, comes out. The other one is sulfates. You know, sulfates come out, but if you don't have enough oxygen, what do you get out? What is this? Hydrogen sulfate, H2S, yeah, yeah. So those, these things are as a result of anoxic conditions at the bottom. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in terms of oligotrophic versus eutrophic lakes. Okay, but over here what we need to understand that lakes just physically are very, very variable. And a lot of this has to do with the light penetration and how big this littoral is going to be as well. Um, there's a description of the littoral zone in any case. Okay, here's the thing that kind of, I don't know why it fascinates me, but uh, here's the thing that I love to talk about, is this whole notion of thermal stratification. I wish I had a red... I wish I had a red pen. Thermal stratification. And uh, what happens to water when it gets warm? What, what happens to water's density when it gets warm? It decreases. It would decrease. So it would float. And so you have layers of water. What happens is ah, in lakes you get these layers of water that begin to float on one another. Again, if you float, if you've swum in the summer on a nice flat lake and it's, oh, this is so warm, and then all of a sudden you put your hand down, you know, you're, you're doing a little stroke and three foot down, all of a sudden it goes from like 20, or sort of 75 or 80 degrees to, whoa, you know, that's like 40 degree water you've kind of penetrate what we, what, what we call the thermocline. And so what happens over time is that warm water begins to float on cold water. Water is at its absolute densest at 4 degrees C. And this is the cool thing. Up in the north, when water gets cooled to lower than 4 degrees C, that begins to float, and that's where your ice begins to form. So it's kind of a cool dynamic that I love. You know, I, I've never seen the, the ice formation. But it's a very, very cool dynamic uh, that you can see, especially in the summer on Lake Watery, that, you know, you go down there, and, and once you drop that sun down there, you say, okay, I, I get this lake variability thing because it's, it really is variable. And so th a temperature variability is the big one. Uh, out in this part of the world, you might have 85 degrees up here, uh, 85 degrees F in the summer, or even more. And you go down 20 foot, and that might be sitting around 40 degrees F. Because what's happening is you've got light penetration maybe to 3 or 4 foot in Lake Watery in some of these large uh, uh, warm, warm water lakes uh, over here in the south. Um, but you go down, there's zero light penetration. And because the warm is floating on the cold, and we don't have lake turnovers here, we'll talk about that in a minute, you, you have a lot of stratification that happens. Now in winter, that stratification is, is essentially moved, removed. But in the summer, you can see that, that really well. Okay, so they talk about a few profiles uh, in the lake, you know, for instance, if this is your surface over here, 
you know, light would basically, if we're looking at um, depth, and I've got a tutorial for you guys on this one, versus light, or let's call it light, the amount of light available. Uh, as you go deeper, light penetration will drop off like that. So that's simple. Um, the same thing would look like that for temperature. You get a temperature profile. But what often happens is the profile doesn't quite look as sort of well behaved as that. You often have a temperature profile that looks like this. So it's, sorry, this is T. Oh, T's on the X axis. Excuse me, thank you. Yes, yes. So we've got temperature here, and you go down and down, and you don't find much. And then all of a sudden you whoop, and then you see this kind of thing going down. And this place, over, basically this uniform temperature here is because you've got some mixing on the surface of the water. So the surface of the water, you know, you've got a little bit of wind blowing and that kind of churns the water in. Uh, and it mixes the surface of the water. But, you know, it's, it's like when you go swimming. But at a point, that warm water is now floating on top of the cooler water. And there's a very, very noticeable, and it's often easy to feel, noticeable change in water. And where that change is greatest, that change, that point is what we call the thermo... Let me write this over here. Thermocline. Um, in the winter, over here, we don't see a thermocline developing. In the summer, you will definitely see it. I'm sure you've seen it out on the lakes. Okay, you can... It's, it's, it's very easy to see. It's, it's sensible, basically. Um, so that's basically as a result of warm water sitting on top of cold water, but also this surface mixing effect that you have over here. Okay? So that's something that we, that we have. Now, here's a, a cool thing about our temperature profiles. Uh, and let's have a look. What's, what's this? Depth and DO. Yeah, temperature and DO profiles. They're different for eutrophic lakes versus oligotrophic lakes. Let's first de define what eutrophic would be. Who's, been, who's seen pictures of Lake Tahoe? You have, have you been there? Oh, yeah. Okay, you got... Have you been to Lake Tahoe? How old are you? 24. Okay. Bucket list. Go to Lake Tahoe <laughs> and see it. <laughs> have you been there? No, okay. I haven't. Yeah, you, you better get that on your bucket list earlier. Okay. Lake Tahoe is a wonderful place. But Lake Tahoe, what's it? It's really, really clear. It's known for really, really clear water. You can see... You know, 60 foot down at the bottom. That is classically known as an oligotrophic lake. Okay? Oligotrophic means there's very little eutrophication that goes on over there. Okay? You can see for miles through that water, the water is very, very clear. Second disc depths are ridiculous in a 60 foot. A eutrophic lake might be something like Lake Moultrie Down. Uh, closer to the coast. And we've also sometimes seen, you know, I keep on referring to Lake Watery because that's where I did a lot of work. But a eutrophic lake would be a lake that, well, the classic, um, uh, I've been since 19, or since 2006, been over to Uganda every year and have been on Lake Victoria. Now, Lake Victoria is considered a eutrophic lake. There's no such thing as sewage treatment over there. Uh, so basically a city will have a sewage line that just kind of pipes into the lake. Temperatures are 80 to 90 degrees C all the time. And so at any, on any given day, especially five or six calm days, you'll find a plume of algae floating on the water. And that's because there's this excess of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, all of the nutrients, and what's that going to form? 
in the, in the presence of sunlight, you're going to have lots and lots of algal blooms. Okay, so Lake Victoria is kind of the extreme example of a eutrophic lake. Lake uh, Tahoe is the extreme example of an oligotrophic lake. So when that's eutrophic, think kind of green, oligotrophic, think these beautiful crystalline alpine lake type, type things. So let's have a look. Uh, oligotrophic lakes and eutrophic lakes respond differently. Um, and so we're going to start, and let's assume over here that we're up north because it looks a little bit different in other places. Let's assume we're up north where things get really, really cold. Um, there's a phenomenon, a depth, this is temperature, and this is VO. Okay. There's a, no, a phenomenon in the spring and the fall up north that's called a turnover. This is where all of a sudden all of your waters become uniformly mixed. In the spring, basically what happens is that the ice melts on the top of your lake and starts uh, getting warmer and warmer. That begins to drop. This water that was very cold over here, relatively speaking, is going to be a little bit warmer than the stuff at the top. So the stuff that was sitting at the bottom starts moving up. The stuff that was at the top starts moving down. Now, spring turnover in that part of the world is kind of dangerous. Why would that be? Especially if you've got a eutrophic lake. It introduces a lot of organic material to the top layers right. of the water. Well, not only organic matter, but this stuff now has been in contact with that organic matter down at the bottom, and it's become anoxic over time. So this stuff at the bottom kind of moves up, and as it moves up, it basically, de uh, that depleted oxygen sort of state begins to affect everything. Fish don't know where to go when that, that stuff comes up, or they have no place to go, and you have fish kills. So if you, yes, go Is ahead. Is this why the alewives thing happens in the Great Lakes? The, the what? The alewives thing every year in spring you'll get billions of these little fish yes. that die and wash up on the shores of, particularly Lake Michigan, where I grew up. Really? And yeah. It happens every spring. I, would, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Spring turnover, basically, that'll... And that might, you know, especially, you know, if what we know from toxicology, you know, when you have those environmental disturbances, the first, you know, the first creatures that are going to be affected are the young ones. So those that you know, you know you might have some kind of fish kill. What's that called? Is I mean A L A L E wives. A L wife is the fish. It's, uh, just, it's a very it's a uh, particular okay. fish. It's a fish species. Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's cool. Okay, so spring turnover is your state over there. Now what we find in warm southern waters is that this is this is uh, up north. But warm southern waters, this is uh, our winter profile. And what you do is, you know, your temperatures are going to be pretty much uniform. Your VO is going to vary a little bit because there might be a little bit of activity, so your DO may drop off at the bottom. And typically, you'll have uniform dissolved oxygens and uniform temperatures. So, not much thermal stratification that's going on here. Now, here's the cool part of it. If we go to summer, um, Your eutrophic lake so the eutrophic lake you're going to have thermal stratification only a certain amount of light penetration 
So what's your temperature going to do? Temperature is going to go like this. And then at some point you do that. I hope I, I'm not looking over there. VO is going to kind of do the same thing. You've got high VOs. And some of that, because of the high VOs, is because you've got a lot of algae plankton in the water. And so they're generating that dissolved oxygen. But at a certain point, your VOs are going to do that. So did I get that right? Oh, shoot. Wait a minute. Oh, uh, I'm, uh, okay, so, right, we're looking, so I, I just mixed the, uh, so the oligotrophic lake in the picture is up here, okay, so let's just, to avoid, for Kim's sake, let's avoid, so in an oligotrophic lake, okay, so, um, in that oligotrophic lake, you're going to have a temperature that kind of looks like this. So it goes down. But your DO kind of looks like this. Um, why would DO go up in this case? So this is DO. Think back to your notes earlier on when we started the class. That kind of seems really counterintuitive. Remember that your DO, your saturated DO, is inversely proportionate to temperature. So, as temperature drops, and assuming there's not that much activity at the bottom, biological activity consuming this DO, Bottom line is your dissolved oxygen or your water at lower temperatures is able to hold more dissolved oxygen. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so that's an oligotrophic lake. And we're thinking Lake Tahoe here. Okay. All right. So your eutrophic lake, same thing. And in this case, you've got your temperature that goes down. And usually your temperature drop is going to be more pronounced in a eutrophic lake just because your light penetration doesn't go down much more. And in this case, you've got DO that kind of follows because this is where all of the oxygen is generated. You know, you might have a little bit of oxygen mixing in, but thereafter it kind of drops. What you've got here is you've got a lot of O2 consumption at the bottom of the lake. Does that make sense, guys? Kim, does that make sense? <laughs> okay. Then what happens in the fall, okay, that's your spring turnover. Let's think back to, um, in the fall, what's going to happen is your top layer is going to freeze up again. So the water over here gets colder and colder, gets below 4 degrees C. Um, so some of that is, you know, uh, is going to fall down and eventually some of it, uh, as it gets below 4 degrees C, will go ahead and sit on top. But basically, as your temperature gets colder and colder, that profile is going to move this way and you have this thing again. So fall turnover. And then in winter... You go here. And again, this is what it would look like over here. It looks like full turnover, except we don't have those catastrophic burps, if you like, of anoxic uh, conditions. In the winter up north, you'd have um, winter stratification that would, in an oligotrophic lake, okay, it's still there. Uh, essentially look like this. Your temperature would be very cold at the top. So very cold and then kind of... And so that stuff up there is ice. Okay? So your temperature falls off. And your DO is pretty much kind of constant from top to bottom because, again, you've got nothing munching away over here. 
here. In a eutrophic lake, if you had a lot of ice and snow, is you, you'd have the same temperature profile, but that anoxic water would essentially be trapped at the bottom. Um, and that might not, sorry, it wouldn't be trapped at the bottom because there's no stratification. I would imagine that this phenomenon would be as a result of biological activity, even at low temperatures. Okay, so this is not sort of absolute gospel, you know, it, it's not going to happen on every lake. But you will find that these general trends will occur and it will help you understand whether the lake is eutrophic or more oligotrophic. So it gives you a sense of the trophic status of that lake. And it's really, uh, you know, uh, to me, this, th this whole idea of temperature profiles and, and warm water layering on cooler water is so much part of that dynamic of what's happening in your lake ecology, your lake chemistry. And that's why we really can't say, gosh, you know, lakes are just evenly mixed. They're not there. They're a real different animal. Before I rub this out or wipe this out, any questions on this? Okay. Um, so temperature, temperature profiling, you know, the whole idea of water floating on other water kind of, to me, that's, I don't know why, it's just appealing. There's that, um, there's this uh, PowerPoint slide of density uh, layering in reservoirs. And I've actually seen it at the headwaters of Lake Wateree, where you let down your sond, you know, you're in, say, 30 or 35 foot of water. You let down your sond, and uh, you've got very clear turbidities, and then you hit really, really bad turbidities, very, very high turbidities, and then you let it down further, and there's, you know, your turbidities are, are lower again. And in that case, is what's happened is as the water has flowed into the lake, um, you've had, say, water from the river, which is a higher turbidity, doing this. Its uh, temperature is greater than, or is greater than the temperature that, that's at the bottom of the lake, T River, but lower than the temperature on the surface of the lake. So it kind of comes down and it goes like this. So it forms this layer of turbid material. So if you had to sit here on a boat and lower down your sond, low turbidity, lower it a little bit, whoop, it went up, lower it again, whoop, it went down. So that's kind of some, some of the things that you can see. I've only seen it once, but it's kind of cool when you actually see it. And it explains perhaps some of those readings that you might get as you, as you go along. So that's kind of another cool thing that we see in, in reservoirs. Um, now, a lot of this particular PowerPoint presentation has stuff on uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, and I'm not necessarily going to rehash that with you guys. I think you guys have looked at it already. But uh, what we'll do is just go through um, the gases, nitrogen and oxygen and CO2, and look at their solubilities. How are we doing for time? What's the time now? It's 3.30 right now. 3.30. Why don't we take a quick break and then come back? It's the graveyard shift. <laughs>